Hi there. So we're going to be starting chapter 9, which covers molecular structure. And in this first lecture on chapter 9, we're going to cover the types of bonds um, and how atoms bond. So first of all, um, atoms bond because of an attractive force between them. Um, here we see the potential energy functions um, for a typical bond structure, okay? Remember that the force um, is equal to the negative derivative of the potential energy. So you can figure out what the force is just by looking at this potential energy curve. Now, fundamentally, bonds are due to electric forces. And these forces are related to the potential energy function shown here. Depending on the type of bond, the potential energy function might be different from type of bond to type of bond. Now, a stable molecule is going to form where the potential energy has a minimum value. And here you can see that's at the bottom of this curve. So if you break this curve down, you're going to have a repulsive potential if the atoms get too close to one another. And then you're going to have an attractive potential that decays off towards zero as the atoms get further and further apart. And what that results in is sort of a hard wall potential as the potential goes to zero, right? It goes up towards that asymptote. And then it dips down, forms a minimum, and then comes back up, and then decays off to zero as R goes to infinity. So that's what your potential energy function is going to look like. It'll have the same basic shape regardless of the type of bond. But again, the potential energy function will differ a little bit from bond to bond. So the repulsive force at very small separation distances is due to a couple of things. First of all, as the nuclei get closer and closer together, um, because the distance there, R, that's plotted is the distance center to center between the nuclei of the two atoms. So as the nuclei get closer and closer together, the positive charge uh, at the positive charges at the center of the atom are going to repel one another. And so the potential is due to that. It's also due to the overlap in the electron clouds. Um, as you push it closer and closer together, the electrons in those two clouds are kind of forced into occupying the same um, set of quantum numbers, which violates the exclusion principle. And so there's, there's some of that um, in there too. And then, of course, the force between the atoms is attracted at larger distances and decays off to zero. The form of that potential energy function looks like this. You have U of R, which stands for your potential energy, is equal to minus A over R to the nth power plus B over R to the nth power. Now, A, M and M are small integers, and A is associated with the attractive force, and B is associated with the repulsive force. Now, the exact values of M, N, A, and B depend upon the type of bond that you have and the atoms that are bonding together. At large separations, the slope of the curve is positive. That corresponds to a positive slope, which corresponds since the force is minus the gradient potential. The gradient is the slope on the curve, right? So if you have a positive slope, then you have a negative force, which means an attractive force. And at equilibrium separation distance, the attractive and the repulsive uh, forces just balance. That is the zero point there um, where the force is zero, the slope is zero, um, and that will be the length stated or the distance center to center between the nuclei, so that's the bond length. We're going to discuss um, ionic and covalent bonds um, in this chapter, but it's also important to realize that you have Van der Waals bonds and hydrogen bonds as well. Um, these are secondary bonding types, um, and we're only going to discuss the stronger bonds, the ionic and the covalent. Now, ionic bonding occurs when you have two atoms combining so that one or more electrons are transferred from one atom to the other. Um, then the ionic bond itself is caused by the Coulomb attraction between these oppositely charged ions. Uh, the perfect example of this is table salt, sodium chloride. So you have your sodium I, uh, your sodium, it's going to donate an electron, it's going to get rid of that electron, it's in that um, first column of the periodic table, the group one, and so it really wants to get rid of that electron creating a positive ion. Now chlorine, however, is a halogen, and it really wants to accept that electron so that it can have a full shell. Um, so the sodium donates its electron to the chlorine, the chlorine then becomes negatively charged, the sodium is positively charged, and they're attracted to one another. When that electron makes the transition in chlorine from the E is equal to zero to a negative energy state, there's energy released. And this energy is called the electron effect. 
uh, affinity of the atom. So what that means, sodium is donating its electron to the chlorine and it releases some energy. The energy in the chlorine is released because that extra electron finally fills up that 3P shell. And when you have a filled shell, then that's a more stable configuration. What that means energetically is that you have a lower energy. Okay, so that energy is released and that's your electron affinity. There's another kind of energy that's discussed in your text, and that's the dissociation energy. And the dissociation energy is the amount of energy that's needed to break the bond and to produce neutral atoms. Okay, so how much it takes to break the bond is the dissociation energy. So here's a plot <clears throat> of the um, potential energy for sodium chloride. And you can see here that if you look at the curve, the bond length is 0.24 nanometers center to center between the sodium and the chlorine nuclei. So that occurs at the minimum of the curve. And then if you take the absolute value of the energy at the minimum of the curve, that's 4.2 eV. And that's your dissociation energy. That's how much energy you have to give to break that bond. So ionic bonding, as we said, is due to a Coulomb interaction, a Coulomb attraction between the positive sodium and the negative chlorine. Now, if you remember, the potential energy for the Coulomb potential is the product of the two charges divided by the constant 4 pi epsilon naught. Epsilon naught is the permittivity of free space, equal to 8.854 times 10 to the minus 12 um, Coulomb squared per newton meter squared, and then divided by the radius or the distance between the sodium and the chlorine nuclei. Okay. Now, in this case, for sodium and chlorine, the charge uh, for the sodium is going to be plus E, um, and the charge for the chlorine is minus E. So the product of those two is minus E squared. Um, your total potential energy would be the sum of that attractive Coulomb energy and then that repulsive potential energy. So that would give you your total energy. Now, they form the bond because the energy of the molecule is actually going to be lower than the energy of the two neutral atoms together. So it's energetically favorable for that molecule to form. All right, And that's due to that Coulomb attractive potential energy. Ionic bonds are generally formed um, between atoms in groups 1 and 2 and groups at, in groups uh, 6 and 7. Those are your alkali metals, your alkaline earth metals, your halogens, and then your group 6. Okay? So we often uh, put numbers on what type of bond is going to form. And the number that we use to sort of parameterize what kind of bond we're going to get is the electronegativity. Okay, the electronegative elements are going to readily acquire electrons and become negative ions. And then the electropositive elements readily give up their electrons to become positive, um, positive ions. Okay, so we use, just use the electronegativity, though, to symbolize that. Electronegativity is often symbolized with the Greek letter chi. And the values on the electronegativity range from 0.7 to 4. Um, this is is a dimensionless quantity. Your highest electronegativity, the thing that most wants to acquire those electrons, is your fluorine. It's up here with a value of 4. And then the smallest electronegativity is francium and cesium at 0.7. So those are your smallest values. So those want to give up their electrons the most. So examples of ionic bonding. Ionic bonding often occurs in salts and ceramics. And what you've got a lot of times is, for example, the sodium chloride, the table salt, you've got a group 1 and a group 7 that bond. But there's a lot of examples of this, and a lot of these are salts and ceramics. Okay. Now, the other kind of bond that I want to cover is a covalent bond. So if an ionic bond is electron donation and acceptance between ions, a covalent bond is a sharing of electrons between two atoms. So a covalent bond between two atoms is one in which electrons supplied by either one or both atoms are then shared between the two atoms. Covalent bonds can be described in terms of the wave functions, and that's what we're going to do here for the example of hydrogen gas. So 
The reason we picked hydrogen gas is just because it has the simplest wave function. Um, if you look at the electron wave function for the hydrogen atom, we know what it is exactly, and here it is. Um, it's uh, proportional to a decaying exponential. Now, when these um, atoms are very far apart, the wave functions don't overlap. Okay, but as you move the hydrogens closer and closer together, the wave functions for the electrons start to overlap, and then you have a significant value of the sum of these two wave functions directly in between, all right? So what that means is that the probability that the electron will be in between the two atoms is actually larger than it is on the left or the right, okay? What that means is that basically the electrons spend more of their time in between the two atoms than they do on either other side. And you can model that as though there were a negative charge, net negative charge, sitting in between the two nuclei. And what that would do is that would create a Coulomb attraction um, for the nucleus to that electron cloud and then this nucleus to the electron cloud, and that holds the um, atoms together. And that's your covalent bond. Now, ionic bonds occur um, for your groups 1 and 2 and your groups 6 and 7. And these atoms have very different values of electronegativity. One wants to donate and one wants to accept. Covalent bonds occur for atoms that have similar electronegativity because they need to share, right? Um, and the bonds are determined by the valence orbitals, those outermost orbitals, and often the S and the P-shaped orbitals dominate that bonding. Now, your covalent bonds often occur for so-called organic compounds. Organic compounds are things that um, have carbon in them. Now, carbon has sort of a middling value of electronegativity, and a typical organic bond might be between carbon and hydrogen. Hydrogen also has a pretty middling um, electronegativity, and one of them has an electronegativity of about 2.1 and the other one about 2.5, so the values are very similar. Remember, the range is from 0.7 to 4, so two-ish is right there in the middle. Now what happens is you form covalent bonds to get to the octet that famous octet rule. What that means though is that you're just trying to fill up that outermost shell. And for a, um, a p orbital, remember that to have a totally filled outer, you've got to get to eight total electrons. And so what they'll do is they'll share electrons until the total number of electrons shared is eight. So for example, methane, um, which is a carbon with four hydrogens on it, all sharing um, electrons between one another, and then you can see that the hydrogen shares one of its electrons and carbon shares one of its four outer electrons and then um, that it does that four times and then you can see that the total for carbon is eight electrons. Now hydrogen only has that s orbital to be full so it only needs two electrons to be full so hydrogen sharing and getting up to two and it's happy, carbon sharing getting up to eight total and it's happy. Okay. Now covalent bonds, because they're an electron sharing, <clears throat> what that means is that the electrons have to be located in between the two atoms. And that means that they're directional, okay? Um, this is very different from an ionic bond. If you think about it, an ionic bond is um, sort of, it doesn't matter what direction it takes place in because it's dealing with that Coulomb attracted potential, which um, it doesn't matter. It's spherically symmetric, right? One's a positive ion, one's a negative ion, and they're just attracted to one another. And it wouldn't matter if you put them together like this or like this or like this, right? Covalent bonds, very different. Since the electrons are shared, they have to be shared in between the two atoms. So they're very directional. Um, you can get covalent bonds by overlapping s orbitals, and it looks like that. Or you can have an s and a p orbital overlap, and it looks like that. Or you can have two p's overlap along the orbital axis, and it looks like that. Or you can have them overlap kind of sideways, and then they overlap at the top and the bottom of the dumbbell, and it looks like this. Okay? There's more covered about um, s and p orbitals and what the shapes of those look like in the, um, the lecture that I've posted below from Crash Course Chemistry, so be sure to watch that.
Okay, now remember, your electronegativity is kind of what tells you what sort of bonds are going to form. You can look at the electronegativity and see, well, if the electronegativities for the two elements are very different, they're more likely to form an ionic bond. If the electronegativities are very similar, they're more likely to form a covalent bond. But you might be asking in your head right now, um, gee, what's really the big difference? I mean, one sort of donates its electron, one sort of shares its electron, but aren't there cases where it's not quite as clear cut? And the answer to that is certainly yes. So you can imagine that a sharing of electrons kind of looks like this, where you have this beautiful sort of symmetric looking agreement. But you can also imagine a sharing of electrons where one atom kind of hogs the electrons more than the other, and that's a polar covalent bond, and it looks like this. And then you have your pure donation and acceptance, and then that would look like this ionic picture over here. Okay, so there's kind of a range of values. Now, there was sort of a line drawn in the sand at this value of 1.67 for this difference in the electronegativity. So the rule goes like this. If you subtract the two electronegativities of the atoms, and that subtraction gives you a difference greater than 1.67 in absolute value, then the bond is considered to be an ionic bond. And if it's less than 1.67, then it's considered to be primarily a covalent bond. Now, if you have a middling value between 0 and 1.67, then the electrons are going to spend more of their time with the more electronegative atom. And that makes your polar covalent bond, right? Now, polarity, I'm talking about polarity. This should remind you of the electric dipole moment that hopefully you covered in your introductory physics class. Remember a dipole moment is if you have two charges that are opposite um, in sign but equal in magnitude and they're separated by some distance here called D, okay, then you have an electric dipole moment between those two. What an electric dipole moment does for you is that if you're in an electric field, your electric dipole will kind of rotate until it's aligned with the field, all right, kind of wants to go, the negative part of the charge wants to go upstream and the positive wants to go downstream and so it will rotate in the electric field until that happens. Electric dipole moments can also cause weak bonds between one another and there's a lot of other effects, but hopefully this um, kind of gives you a little reminder of it. Oftentimes the electro electric dipole moment is symbolized by a P, it is a vector. Um, I think your textbook uses an R for the distance between, but tomato, tomato. Now the Q here is not um, the total charge. Remember, if you have a positive and you negative charge, you sum those together, you're going to get zero. Q here is the charge on either charge. So you've got a plus Q and a minus Q separated by a distance D. Okay? Now, if you had a purely covalent bond, then you'd have an electric dipole moment of zero between the two atoms because the sharing would be symmetric and there would be no net charge on either side. Makes sense, right? In an ionic bond, your electric dipole moment is going to be maximized for that particular bond, right? Whatever the bond sweet spot length is, you're going to have your maximum charge distribution separated out like that, okay? So we can use this electric dipole moment to kind of figure out <clears throat> how much something is ionic and how much something is covalent. It's really a sliding scale. So if you want to figure out the fractional ionic character or the percent ionic character, if you just want to multiply that times 100%, you'll have your percentage ionic character, then you can compare the measured dipole moment for that molecule to the ideal dipole moment for that molecule. So you just divide your measured dipole moment by what it would be if it were ideal, the charge, um, times the bond length. All right, and that'll give you your fractional ionic character. Okay, so um, hopefully if you have any questions, you'll let me know, and I hope you enjoyed it.